Yeah, the next presentation is about how Nordic country mainstream, how and why they mainstream uh, climate change into the International Development uh, Corporation. Yes. Thank you, Ha, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, the research that I'm presenting here has been, been done uh, not only by myself, but, but also by my colleague, uh, Adis Jevo, who is uh, safely sitting in the back of, of the room. <laughs> Um, uh, the research has been conducted in the, in the context of the, the Nordic Strategic Adaptation Research Center of Excellence, or known as Nordstar, in which quite a few SCI colleagues uh, from the Stockholm Center are involved. Um, I should note up front, uh, like many other presentations uh, today, uh, that this is also still a work in progress, so we still very much welcome your feedback. As many of you will know, Nordic donors have generally quite a good uh, reputation when it comes to providing aid. And this graph is, is basically one of the, one of the ways of, of showing that. Um, it shows it in a rather quantitative way. But as you can see, um, as one of the, the main yardsticks or one of the main ways of, of providing aid um, is to show the percentage of the gross national income. And compared to the OECD average, the Nordic countries, as you can see on the slide, are doing very well. But also, more importantly, they're also doing better than the 0.7% the UN target. So, from a quantitative perspective, one could say that the Nordic countries are, are, let's say, leaders of the class. But also from a qualitative perspective, it's generally said that the Nordic countries' development cooperation is remarkably free of, of self-interest. So, the question informing this research is to which extent did this leading role in providing development aid in general can also extend to the area of providing climate-related aid. So, this, these are the questions that we've been looking at in our research and really trying to figure out how and why the Nordic countries have uh, engaged in, in providing climate-related aid, and also which type of approaches have they been adopting. So before we go on, it's, it's very useful, to, for at least for some of us, to give a reminder of what we actually mean by mainstreaming. And the first question, of course, is what we, what we actually have to think about, what is exactly being mainstreamed? And then there are several things one, one can look at. One is one can look at climate projections for the future and, to, and examine to the extent uh, to which these are being taken into account in development planning. One can also look more broadly to climate impacts, uh, as first order impacts, second order impacts, and possibly uh, more. Um, and then finally, and this is an interesting framing that the North Star program as, as a whole is, is trying to, to implement, is one can also look at the impacts of climate policies. So to, how, to which extent is adaptation to the impacts of climate policies being taken into account? Another question that one should look at, and, and just to be clear, uh, for us, we were looking at all three of these. Um, another question that we need to look at and think about is, is mainstreaming into what exactly? And here the usual focus is, is primarily on the recipient countries and the development planning processes in those countries. But the, the question or the, the, the angle informing our research is primarily to actually look at the donor countries. And what we see from the literature was a lot of literature about mainstreaming climate change in the, development, uh, in the developing countries themselves. There's actually not that much literature looking at the processes within the donor countries. So we think that this is a, an important research gap. So rather than seeing mainstreaming as a rather linear process where one first tries to identify the risk and then takes them into account, we try to conceptualize it as a range of different choices. And the first type of choices is more about the design of mainstreaming in the donor country. So really, this is about the, the practical hows and whys at, at the, within, within the donor, so within the, 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 let's say, the donor agency. So here, there, there are different ways of approaching it. On, one at, on the one hand, uh, you can, or at one end of the spectrum, as you can call it, um, you could say that, that uh, you really should try to fully internalize the climate risks in your development planning. On the other hand, you can also decide to uh, implement uh, climate change through having a few very strategic adaptation-related projects. And in the middle, you could also say, well, we actually need to in implement climate change in those projects where it's most likely needed by first systematically screening your entire portfolio. These types of choices are very different from another type of uh, choice, choice, which are the funding choices. And these choices are normally, uh, yeah, or tend to be slightly more contentious and slightly more controversial, because these are the choices, first of all, how much money should be uh, allocated to climate-related aid. Also, uh, from which budget should we try to uh, get that money? So, for example, from the official development assistance or beyond. So, we try to conceptualize it as two different choices, 
also in terms of trying to, to make an assessment of these, these choices, because trying to make an assessment of the funding choice is very different than making an assessment of the design choice. So to sum up, and also to indicate what we've been looking at in our research, in terms of design choices, we've first been looking at the extent to which there has been a high-level commitment to address climate change, but also to climate-proof development assistance. Second, we've been looking at the, the tools that have been both available, but also have been applied in practice. And we've been looking at the expertise, whether that is present or not. When it comes to funding choices, we've been looking at the level of climate finance, whether this is part of ODA or not, and whether it's additional or can be perceived as additional to the 0.7% target. And finally, how uh, the climate-related ACE has been calculated. So looking first at the design choices, it is clear that, um, or sometimes more broadly defined, climate change is either priority or it has been a cross-cutting issue for all three of the countries. Uh, however, this doesn't always mean that, that countries also have been looking at climate-proofing their development assistance. And although for Sweden and for Denmark this has been quite clear commitment that they want all their development assistance to be climate-proof, this has been less so the case for Norway, where, there's, uh, where the focus has also been primarily on mitigation. When, we, when it comes to tools, it was notable that the Danida has been one of the first uh, agencies to develop a practical toolkit trying to help development officers and, pro and program officers to implement climate risk in their development assistance. Also, the NIDA has developed a mandatory screening note, which is basically a checklist for development officers to, um, to, to tick off. Um, and finally, the NIDA has been one of the, the countries which has um, implemented a portfolio screening. So basically, they've been looking at climate risks for specific countries uh, throughout their portfolio. Something similar has been done by Norway and NORAD, uh, which in the end also led to a practical guide, again, trying to help their officers to implement uh, climate or climate-related aspects in practice. When it comes to CEDA, and obviously there are a few people in the room who will know more about this than, than, than myself and my, my colleague, but um, there have been, at least from what, what we can tell, one of the most notable developments is the, the, the start of a help desk uh, organized by Uppsala and Gothenburg universities, which can provide technical assistance to CEDA officers. But also in the future, it's going to be interesting to see how CEDA will integrate uh, climate-related risks into their development assistance through their CEDA at Work program. I will move on slightly quickly to the funding ch uh, choices. Um, here, I think it's interesting to notice that there's actually, from what is being reported, there's a very substantive amount uh, or very substantial amount of, of climate-related aid, although these numbers should not be taken as, as a given, and because they, one would lead to look at the assumptions that behind, that's behind the reporting of those numbers. Also, one cannot simply add up the A adaptation and the M mitigation, because some projects have overlapping. When it comes to the, the choices in terms of the... Uh, the, whether the, the funding is, is new and additional or not. All countries have argued uh, convincingly that it's new and additional funding under the UNFCCC because it's been above their 0.7% target. However, from a developing country perspective, this could still be criticized because in, in practice it's still possible that some resources might be diverted. Also, uh, and this relates back to the numbers, that there is a risk of over-reporting, which has been noted in the literature and also by practical assessments, at least for CEDA. Um, then, generally about the approaches to mainstreaming, from the literature on mainstreaming and also on, on climate policy integration, one can see three different approaches. One would be the procedural approach or the procedural perspective. So here what we can basically see that there's a variety of tools which are used to raise awareness and to incentivize the, the program officers to take climate risks into account. However, what we find is also is that even though these, these tools are normally there, the, the question is whether they are applied. And here it really matters to which extent there is actually expertise. And for Danida and to some extent for CEDA, the, the expertise overall, compared to the, the overall high-level goals, is still limited. Then from an organizational perspective, one could then say, well, actually, climate change, of course, not just for, for the development agencies, but the Ministry of Environment should also be involved. I'll wrap up with this sentence. Um, but here the risk is that the, the Ministry of Environment might, might actually have different priorities. 
Maybe a final sentence, sorry Anna. Um, <laughs> as in, also in terms of inviting further reflections, I think this has one of, been one of the most challenging research areas that I've been involved in, simply by looking at the data availability or the lack thereof, um, and also the transparency of the documentation. Again, so that's why I very much welcome any feedback from, from CEDA or possibly NORAD or Danita, for people who might be present in the room and provide feedback in terms of where, whether we're on the mark or not. Um, I will leave it there. Thank you.